Church, well, we are on a half-time break between sermon series. So I have one more week in this half-time series. And what I wanted to do today is to pause as we reset and remind ourselves of a couple of basics and talk about church. So we had a big week, AGM, on Monday. And so I wanted to spend this morning painting a picture for you or giving you a vision of what our church could be like. Now, I've read tons of books on church and how to do church, what makes church great. There's a lot of amazing examples of great churches out there that we could learn from. But the example that I want to give you this morning, a model church, if you like, is a church that comes out of the Bible. Now, of course, there's a ton of churches in the Bible mentioned all over the place, being written to all sorts of examples of great and not so great churches in the Bible. But the particular church that has captivated my attention for years now is a church that comes up in just a few chapters in the middle of the book of Acts. Now, as you're going to see today, this church is pretty much the whole package. It's kind of just got everything together. But what makes this church particularly interesting for me and for us is its context. Because the context of this church in the middle of Acts is not unlike our context here in Johannesburg. So I'm talking about the church in Antioch. The church in Antioch, you can turn so long to Acts 11, stories told Acts 11 through 15. And while you get there, let me tell you a little bit about Antioch and about this church. So Antioch was a major metropolitan city in then Syria, today modern day Turkey, a town called Antakwa in Turkey. So a major metropolitan area. When the Romans kind of took everything over, Antioch became the capital city of Syria and of their sort of province of the east. It became the third most influential city in the Roman Empire. So third only to Rome, Alexandria, Antioch. Majorly influential city. It was a port city, a transportation hub, and a capital, which meant that Antioch was strategically very important, very influential city, and an immensely complicated city. Whenever you've got a port city, whenever you've got a major metropolitan area, and you've got influence, you're always going to get a complex city. So very uh, complex and very multicultural uh, and multi-religious. So the temple of Daphne was located there, which was this kind of cult center for the worship of Apollo and Artemis and all sorts of other Greek and Roman gods. It was infamous, Antioch, for its moral decay. In fact, things were so bad in Antioch that one of the Roman authors, his name was Juvenal, he uh, he criticized the moral pollution of Rome by saying this. He said the sewerage of the Orontes River, which is a river flowing out of Antioch, he says the sewerage of the Orontes River had for too long been discharged into the Tiber River, which is a river flowing through Rome. What he's saying is Antioch was so corrupt that it was polluting Rome 3,000 kilometers away. That's how bad things were in Antioch. So this would not typically be at the top of your list of potential places to plant a church. Kind of ask people today, hey, where should we plant a church? Like, I don't know, I'm in Hawaii, Mauritius, and these lovely places. You typically would not put Antioch. It's just too complicated, too far gone, this major influential city. And yet... A church was planted in Antioch, and it thrived and became, I think, the most important church in the history of Christianity. Now, if you know me a little bit by now, you'll know that I am prone to getting overexcited about things and make some dramatic statements. So let me back that up. Why the church at Antioch was possibly the most important church 
in the history of Christianity. So here's a little CV, a resume of the church at Antioch. So Luke, probably converted at Antioch. The Gospel of Matthew, written out of Antioch. Antioch was the first church to intentionally send out missionaries to the rest of the world. The very first church to send missionaries. It was also the first church to intentionally proclaim the gospel to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles. In other words, guys, as we sit today in Joburg or South Africa or wherever you're listening today, Chances are we are here because of the church at Antioch that sent missionaries out of Palestine and that reached non-Jewish people. That's why we are here today. It was also the home base, the platform, the home church, the sending church of none other than Barnabas, you know him, and some other guy you might have heard of, his name was Paul. That's right. The Apostle Paul, the church at Antioch, was his sending church. All of Paul's three missionary journeys were sent out of Antioch and he came back to them. And one last thing. The name Christian. So the title Christian, that's what we are. That name Christian originated around the people of Antioch. The believers there were first called Christians. Right, you with me? This is clearly an important church. And it's really a classic city church. A paradigm shifting, world changing, missionally effective movement of God in one of the most diverse complex, corrupt cities of the world. A city not terribly unlike Joburg. And amidst some of the same challenges that we face today in Joburg, they faced them, this church thrived. So let's have a look at some of these features of the church at Antioch that I believe should be our kind of framework as we move forward as a church. So here are five features of the church at Antioch. And I'm just going to list five of them as they come up in the scriptures, Acts 11 through 15. So number one, Antioch was a missional church. So their story starts in Acts 11. I'm going to read from verse 19 to 26. And it says this. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So you might remember the story of the birth of the church, going back to Pentecost, 
Pentecost comes, the disciples are gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, empowers them. Peter preaches. Thousands get added to the church. So the church is launched in Jerusalem and it grows rapidly such that persecution from the Jewish religious leaders comes quickly. That persecution culminates in the story of the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7 and 8, the first martyr in that story comes Saul who would become Paul. And because of that persecution, after that moment, the believers spread out out of Jerusalem. And as they go, they share the gospel. The ones that went to Antioch, as you picked it up, others went and they shared it to those, the Jewish kind of fellow countrymen. But those that went to Antioch shared it with everybody and something spectacular happens. We see the hand of the Lord was there. The grace of God was with them. Multiple times we read and God added to their numbers. And this amazing church is started in Antioch. Now, for me, one of the biggest questions is, I mean, who were these guys, these heroes that left Jerusalem to plant this church in one of the most difficult cities of the world and saw this revival take place? Who were these guys? We want to know. Well, we don't know who they are, but we do know who they are not. So you go back to Acts chapter 8 when this all started, when they started to disperse out of Jerusalem. And in verse 1 it says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So we don't know the names of the guys who planted the church in Antioch. We don't know who they are, but we know who they are not. They are not the apostles. Which means, I mean, just let, let that sink in a little bit. Which means that this gospel explosion in one of the largest, most influential cities of the world, this gospel explosion did not happen because of one or two kind of super leaders, but ordinary believers living their ordinary lives with gospel intentionality. This is the very first time in the Bible that we read that evangelism happens and it's not the leaders, it's not the apostles, it's not the teachers, it's not the prophets. The very first time we see evangelism in the hands of ordinary believers going about their ordinary lives with gospel intentionality and the gospel takes root and explodes in the midst of this great city of Antioch. It's mind-blowing. And especially when we want to think about a city like Joburg and a desire for there to be a gospel explosion in Johannesburg. It will not happen because of one or two super leaders, but ordinary believers like you and like me, everybody watching this, ordinary believers continuing to live their ordinary lives, their everyday lives, if you like, with gospel intentionality. You know, I said this on Monday night that Rosebank Union Church has such incredible potential to be at the center of a gospel explosion in Joburg. I mean, our heritage, our location, our resources has led to this in incredible platform that we have. But the effectiveness of that platform is going to be in the hands of Ordinary people living ordinary lives with gospel intentionality. That's what I mean when I use the word missional. I don't just mean global missions. Of course, we include that. Ordinary people living ordinary lives with gospel intentionality. So what does that mean? And to be honest, it's embarrassingly simple. If we look at Antioch, what did these guys do? I mean... 
uh, I mentioned to you that they were first called Christians there. Have you ever wondered where that came from, the origin of the word Christians? Well, it comes from Christ ones, the Christ ones. And it started here because the believers there just spoke so much about Jesus that other people referred to them as, oh, those are the Jesus ones. Those are the Christ ones. I mean, literally, the phrase first came up as a mockery. They were using it to mock them. Oh, those are those Jesus ones. Those are those Christ ones. But they became so large in number. They became so distinct. They became such a powerful force that that name stuck. It was just so obvious. Oh, those are the Jesus people. That's where the word Christian simply comes from. Now, again, let's just think about that a little bit. And think about our church. So again, the platform we have, a lot of people in Joburg know about Rosebank Union Church. So when I moved here and was telling people where I was going, most people knew about Rosebank. Oh, yeah, that's that church on that corner. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, that's the one. Most people know about Rosebank Union, but do they know what we're really about? Do they know what we stand for? Do they know what we're passionate about, which should be Jesus? Would we be known as those Jesus ones, those Christ ones? And maybe just take this step closer to home. Think about your own life. Would you be described like that? Yeah, that's that Jesus guy, that Jesus girl. You know, and yeah, at first it was this kind of mockery. There was this awkwardness to it. But eventually it just it became so distinctive. And there was such a force for good that it had to be taken seriously. Would you be known as? And to be honest with you, I mean, for me, that's still one of the simplest, yet toughest challenges in being a Christian. And that is to talk normally in the context of all everyday, ordinary life about Jesus in a way that's winsome. That's what these guys were doing, these Christ ones. And it led to a gospel explosion in the city of Antioch. So that's feature number one. A missional church, serious about Jesus, and Jesus is in everything that they do. Number two, this was a generous and compassionate church. So if you carry on reading... Uh, in Acts chapter 11, so right away, the very next few verses, it says, Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and they mentioned this guy named Agabus, who kind of prophesied that a famine would come. And you read that that famine actually happened. And then you read this, So the disciples in Antioch, so they hear about this, the disciples in Antioch determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in that whole region. Now you, you would have picked up on that language because whenever we talk about tithing in the church, whether that's to missions or whether that's to relief efforts, something like Rays of Hope, or whether that's to the ministry of the church, we always use this kind of language, everyone according to his ability. The sense of compassion, the sense of generosity, the sense of contributing to the work of the church is everybody's responsibility in proportion to what they have. I mean, again, this is really simple, and it's one of the first features of the church at Antioch. One of the very first descriptions of what they are like after the Christ ones is they are generous, compassionate church. And I wonder... For Rosebank, how important this is going to be as we try and make an impact on our city, and that is our generosity and compassion to the city of ours that is very much in need of it. And that's going to start again, not just with the church, but every person according to their ability. Number three, feature Kind of a unique feature of this church is they were a unified church. And today, of course, we talk a lot about this, unity and diversity. Well, unity is very easy 
when everybody's the same. So if you'll talk the same language, eat the same food, like the same music, like to do the same kinds of things in your social time, see the world in the same way, then unity is easy. But when there's diversity, then unity is a lot harder. It takes a lot more work. Which is why, like on a very simple level, why marriage takes work, takes effort. Because man and a woman, they're very different. Don't think the same. Don't, so there's work. There's, there's effort involved there. So if you think about it, especially in the context of cultural diversity, it just makes so much sense that unity in the midst of cultural diversity is going to take a lot of work. I think one of the simplest definitions that I've heard of culture, such a broad topic, but one of the simplest, broadest definitions that I've heard of of culture is this. Culture is everything that you do in your ordinary life that you don't have to think about. It's kind of like these automated principles that govern how you interact with others in the world around you, that you don't have to think about is, is like your culture. So for example, you don't wake up most people and decide what language you're going to speak. You don't decide what kinds of food you're going to eat, what kinds of clothes you're going to wear. You don't wake up and have to make these heavy decisions. Of course, you do decide, what am I going to wear today? And what I'm going to eat for breakfast? Is it the wheat bix or is it the cornflakes? But your cupboard is already stocked with food appropriate to your culture and the culture around you. And your wardrobe is already stocked with clothes that are appropriate to you and your culture and the culture around you. And if you're like me, you keep that bandwidth very small so you have even less decisions to make. So it's even simpler what to wear. You have your Monday outfit, your I don't go to that kind of degree. But that is pretty much, this is, what, this is what culture is about. It's this kind of automatic response that we have that enables us to very efficiently engage with the world around us. I mean, imagine if you had to think about all of these heavy topics. So culture is this remarkably efficient mechanism for governing how we interact with people. It's kind of like you think about your, you know, your subconscious, you know, if you think about breathing, if you think about walking, it just happens in the background. Culture is what happens in the background that enables you to interact in everyday life with the people around you. So here's the thing. That's what it's designed to do, be this efficient process for automating interactions. But now, when you come across a culture that is different, now you have to step out of what was automatic, have to pay attention to some of the differences, and have to add energy in order for that interaction to take place. Which means, quite simply, amidst cultural diversity, you will always need to work, think about, analyze, process. What was automatic, what was subconscious, needs to move to the conscious. So it takes work. The problem is, now thinking church, if you're a city church, like Rosebank is a city church, got this platform in Joburg. If you're a city church, you have automatically signed up to put that effort in to make that work because cities, by definition, are diverse places. Age, gender, socioeconomic status, culture. Think about some of the largest, most influential cities in the world. London, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Sydney. They are all known for being incredibly diverse places. And so churches have got to work, city churches, at bringing in unity amidst cultural diversity. But we, as the church, have a secret weapon that enables us to do this difficult thing of cultural unity amidst diversity that nobody else has. Because when you step back in Christianity and you look across cultures, you realize as a Christian, we are more the same than we are different. 
In other words, we have the same problem, same bag of rocks kind of that Dave was speaking about before uh, in the beginning of the service. And ultimately, same sin, same need for a Savior, same Savior, Jesus, who himself, when he died on the cross, did that, an inevitable consequence is to break down these difficult divisions. We have as the church far greater opportunity to do this than any other organization in the world. So back to Antioch. So if Antioch is this multicultural city, did we see the church there being quite unified amidst diversity? We would expect that. That is exactly what we see. I mean, firstly, we see they were the first ones to preach the gospel to not just Jews, but Gentiles. So they were the very first church that had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. I mean, that's huge. Ephesians 2, that dividing wall of hostility, speaks about the hatred between Jews and Gentiles. In this church, these two groups are coming back together. But you also see it in this interesting little verse in Acts 13, as you move on through Acts in the story of Antioch. So verse 1, it says this. It's a list of the leaders of the church, we presume, at Antioch. And it says, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrog, and Saul, who was, became Paul. So we have a list of the very first leaders of this church. Some of them we know. Saul, who became Paul, and we know Barnabas. But who were those other guys? Right? And, and now we have a little bit of information about these guys for a reason. So we know there's this guy, Simeon. Scripture says, who was called Niger. Does it sound kind of familiar? If you read a lot of Bibles, kind of in the, in the postscript at the bottom of the page, we'll tell you what that word Niger means. It means literally black. So Simeon was a dark-skinned African person. Simeon was our representative from sub-Saharan Africa sitting in the council of this amazing church at Antioch. That's our guy. That's our rep, Simeon. So Simeon called Niger. Then you've got a guy named Lucius, who was from Cyrene, which is a place now called Tripoli in Libya. Again, in Africa, right at the top of Africa. So you've got two African representatives, one from the north, one from the south in this church. And then you've got this guy, Menaean. says that he was a lifelong friend um, of of Herod, which really lifelong friend doesn't do it justice. What the phrase actually means there, uh, I won't go into the detail, but he pretty much he grew up in the same house as Herod, meaning Menaean is this incredibly privileged, rich person. He's in there as well, a Gentile. So you've got Saul, the quintessential Jew, Barnabas, Jew, then you've got these two African representatives, and then you've got this other Gentile, this wealthy influential Gentile called Menaean. That's who we read is kind of this group of the leaders of this church at Antioch. Diversity of ethnic background, diversity of religious background, diversity of socioeconomic background, but one team, one church. So Earl Stanley Jones, I love this, he commented on this and he said, the Antiochian church made Simeon called Niger a prophet and teacher who laid the hands of a black man on Barnabas and Paul to commission them to preach the gospel to Asia and white Europe. And they did it without comment as though this was the normal Christian attitude. I love that. You just kind of read it as a man, this, this is normal. Except we know how much it takes for this to be normal. But we also know It's an inevitable consequence of the gospel. And we certainly have a lot of work to do here at our church, especially in the context of this marvelously diverse place known as Joburg, but we have full gospel power behind us to do it. Number four, it was a spirit-powered church. Obviously, this had to come up. What church could flourish, be effective, be unified amidst diversity, be generous, be gospel-centered without the Holy Spirit clearly at work? 
and you see the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over this church, just in case you were thinking it was because of these people, the text just tell us this was a move of God. So Acts 13, kind of after uh, I read about, you know, who was kind of the leaders there, verse 2 and 3, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. You see, this is the first missionary journey in the history of the church. And it's the Holy Spirit. They're worshiping. They're fasting. They're longing for the Lord. And the Holy Spirit tells them, you need to set these guys apart. They fast. They pray. And the Holy Spirit sends them. It's the Holy Spirit doing the work. I've heard it said before that the book of Acts, you know, the full title of the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. I've heard it said before that that name should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it really is. The Holy Spirit's the one moving behind these people. That's what you're seeing here. Even in some of the key leaders like Barnabas, what a great guy. Even when they mention Barnabas, it says that Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit. It's like you can't talk about key people without mentioning them filled with the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, we just see fingerprints of God over this church. We see this phrase that we came across in Ezra, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Wouldn't you love that to be said of Rosebank? Those are the Christ ones. And it's clear the hand of the Lord is with them. How does that come about? Well, I don't know. But all that we see them doing is praying, fasting, which is why we have days of fasting and prayer. So we long for sovereign work of God to take root in our church and in our city. Number five, it was a gospel-centered church. Of all the hyphenated words in the Christian vocabulary, this is my favorite, gospel-centered church. I don't have time to go, and this is a whole couple of sermons on its own, so let me just do a snapshot here. But perhaps the most important story in the whole history of the church at Antioch takes place in Acts 15. So let me just quickly remind you here. This is a church made up of Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. And so Paul and Barnabas and the leaders of this church who know the gospel know that, hey, these Gentile Christians, they don't have to adhere to the laws of Moses. They don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to keep to food requirements. There's freedom in Christ. So this church is flourishing along the lines of freedom in Christ. It's amazing. All those laws, Old Testament laws, have folded away. And there's this practice of the freedom of Christ, which is massive. For some, that didn't come easy. Peter, the Apostle Peter, now in Jerusalem, he's leading the whole church. Remember, he needed a special vision from God to go, it's okay to eat other kinds of foods. And by the way, in Galatians 2, Antioch comes up again because Peter is a bit discriminatory or hypocritical in his practice of this. There's this incident in Antioch where Peter's there and he's eating with the Gentile believers because there's no wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile Christians. So he's eating with them. He's eating their food. It's all lovely freedom in Christ. And then some important people from Jerusalem come down, some Jewish people. And Peter goes, man, this, this is not going to look good. And he goes back to eating with just the Jewish people. And Paul's having none of this. Paul calls Peter out like, publicly and puts him down for being hypocritical around this issue of freedom in Christ. So this is like a big deal to Paul and Barnabas and the leaders of the church at Antioch. So then in Acts 15, you read about these other Jewish people come, not Christians, and they start going, no, you need to be circumcised. You need to adhere to the laws of Moses in order to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas, man, you want to see them get angry? Like, I wish we had a picture of this. Because generally we think of Barnabas as, oh, gentle. And probably was. He was an encouraging guy. And Paul, we know, was pretty hardcore. You know, but in Acts 15, you read this. So after Paul and Barnabas, listen to this, had no small dissension and debate with them, these 
Jewish people. No small dissension and debate, which is kind of Christianese, for like a massive fight with them. <laughs> like over what? Not over music, not over food, not over all these other peripheral silly things. The gospel. So it's a gospel-centered church. Eventually, this issue blows up so big, Paul and Barnabas go to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and they have the very first, you can go read it, church council in history about this particular issue, which was a critical moment in the church, where finally the church of Jesus Christ was untethered from the legal requirements of salvation. Massive moment. Massive started by the people in Antioch. These were people who took the gospel seriously, who took freedom in Christ seriously, who took salvation by faith in Jesus seriously. Listen, I know as a church, there's a lot of things that we're going to debate, perhaps have no small dissension about. But honestly, really what we need to retain that sense of what we're going to stand up for, stand against, and stand firm on are issues related to the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel-centered church. So what have we learned about this church? Well, really, what we've learned is a church that is, this is so embarrassingly simple, a church that is serious about Jesus, serious about the gospel message of Jesus, that longs for a move of the Holy Spirit in its midst, becomes the kind of church that can flourish, thrive, impact a large, complex city like Johannesburg. It's our hope and our dream that we become that kind of church. Why don't you pray with me as we seek that? God, as we gather before you as people now actually scattered across the city and even further abroad, but having a, a home or some kind of root here in this marvelous city of Johannesburg. God, we come before you as individual members connected to this one body, to this place that you have called us to be. At such a time as this, with this platform that you have been building for hundreds of years. And we pray, God, use us. Use us to be the same kind of influence, impact, in this city that needs you so desperately, in this country that needs us, continent, and the world may ripple effects ripple out through Joburg, South Africa, Africa, and the world because of what you're doing here in this church, a church not unlike Antioch. So Holy Spirit, would you guide us? We thank you for the work that you've been doing. Jesus, would you draw us closer to you? And would you revive within us a passion for your name and your gospel message and at all costs jesus protect our gospel message here at rosebank in jesus name we pray